Welcome to On the Safe Side, a podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. Whether you're joining us for the first time or the second time, as this is our second episode, we'd like to send out a big thank you. For the second timers, we hope you will continue to maintain your perfect attendance. We can't promise you a certificate at the end of the year like in elementary school, but we hope we give you the satisfaction of being informed and perhaps a little entertained. This is Alan Ferguson, and I'm joined by fellow associate editors Barry Bettino and Kevin Drewley. Gentlemen, please say hello to the good folks out there. Hello, Alan. Hi, Hi everybody. Alan. Hi, Alan. On this episode, we'll do a deep dive into one of our stories from the April issue. Hint, you might hear a familiar voice during that segment. Uh, we'll also talk to Safe Start senior safety consultant and renowned speaker Tim Page Bodorf. Okay, is everyone ready? All right, let's go. Each month here at the On the Safe Side podcast, we're going to take a closer look at a feature story from Safety and Health magazine, and we call that our deep dive segment. Joining us again is my colleague, Associate Editor Alan Ferguson, to talk about his story on something that as motorists we probably all experience each and every day in our communities, and that is work zone safety. Alan's going to discuss some new tools and technologies related to work zones. Uh, He's also going to talk about how the death of a roadway worker in Michigan has led to some conversations that now include a really big number of stakeholders. So, Alan, why don't you take us on on a deep dive into this topic? Okay, so first, before I get started, I want to announce that uh, National Work Zone Awareness Week begins April 20th, and you should drive carefully around the men and ladies working hard out on our roads all year long, but take a little time that week to remain especially safe and keep those workers in mind. And the theme of this year's event is Safe Work Zones for All, protect workers, protect road users. And the second part of that is important because while there are a significant number of occupational work zone fatalities, most of the deaths involve non-workers, at least according to one government database. And the key point from those different data sets is there hasn't been any sustained progress toward reducing work zone fatalities. Uh, Those numbers have kind of moved up and down pretty recently. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that From 2003 to 2018, an average of about 123 workers were killed in roadway work zones. Um, The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, meanwhile, which they they record all deaths within a work zone and not just worker deaths, kind of shows an average of 745 annual fatalities from 2014 to 2018. It looked like there was progress as recently as 2013 in both those cases. The occupational deaths dipped down to 105 that year, according to the BLS again. And obviously any death is one too many, but getting below triple digits would have been a great milestone. Instead, those deaths increased each in the next three years and and peaked at uh, 143 as recently as 2016. And it went back down a little bit, according to the latest numbers, with 124 deaths in 2018. The NHTSA numbers, and remember this is all work zone fatalities, have shown a similar pattern to the BLS ones. Again, there was a recent low in 2013, Uh, 593 deaths, but the fatalities went back up for four straight years, peaked at 809 in 2017, then dropped back down to 754 in 2018. For workers, many of these incidents are are likely due to what's known as intrusions, at least according to a 2018 study from CPWR. That organization studied 267 vehicle-related fatalities and found that 61.4% were caused by forward moving vehicles, and that would seem to indicate an intrusion over, say, you know, backwards moving vehicle, which is a back over within a work zone. So what are some of the reasons for these intrusions? One obvious answer that one source gave is distracted driving. Again, that's probably not surprising to anyone out there. Um, Another reason that's probably not surprising is speeding. Same source, however, also pointed to an increasing number of road construction projects and more drivers on the road because of relatively stable fuel prices, and therefore an increase in the number of miles driven. So what are some of the steps that employers can take to prevent these incidents? One source said traffic control plans need to account for both external and internal vehicles, and employers need to make sure that traffic control equipment is working and in quality condition, that it's readily available, and that work zone operations are frequently inspected, and workers on foot need to be in high visibility clothing I believe the ANSI ISEA standard here is a 107-2015. There's also interesting technology it's called Q warning systems around here in the Chicago area. You see the message boards say slow down up ahead. And basically the idea behind that 
is that you know some someone that sees that has more time to slow down, won't get surprised, won't have to slam on the brakes quickly, right. won't rear in somebody, won't swerve into a work zone. There's also something called automated flagger assistance device, and the basic function of this is to get human flaggers off the front lines of traffic and out of harm's way. I think the ones I've seen online kind of have a stop sign or a stop light, and they have an arm that comes down, kind of like a railroad crossing with a flag on the end. Also available are alarms that warn workers that a vehicle is intruding in the work zone, like when a car knocks over a barrel. And, you know, obviously that can help a little bit, but when there's a car coming at high rate of speed, yeah, high rate of speed, that's only a couple seconds of warning time. One source spoke about the use of predictive algorithms, kind of linked to an alert that will let workers know when a vehicle is in danger of a possible intrusion, like maybe this vehicle is moving fast. It's a potential emerging technology for the future. And obviously, perhaps down the road are automated vehicles, which could hopefully make work zone deaths of a thing of the past. And I wanted to ask you, Alan, you had mentioned a, a phrase in the story that was really interesting to me called positive separation uh, between the work zone and traffic. Can you talk a little bit about that and what exactly positive separation means? So I, I can give you an example of positive separation. That's the concrete barriers that you'll often see next to work zones. And obviously, they provide a little more protection than a, a barrel or a cone. And the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, among others, have pushed for the use of positive separation. The issue with that method, however, for some organizations is the cost and weight of those barriers. They're more difficult to haul and set up as a project keeps going down the road. One source advocated for steel barriers, which kind of provide more protection, again, than the barrels and cones. It's a little more lightweight than concrete. And there's also mobile barrier trailers that are connected to a vehicle and they can kind of move from place to place. You also write about some new things the Michigan Department of Transportation is doing. What more can you share about that? I haven't studied all 50 states to see how truly unique in, in regards to the nation, but it is definitely something new for Michigan. I think it has some promise because of a parallel I'll draw in a little bit. So this all started in Michigan after one particular worker death. There's a gentleman named David Snell who was killed by a drunk driver near downtown Detroit in June 2018. That spurred um, C.A. Hull President and CEO Mike Malore to go to MDOT, uh, Michigan Department of Transportation, and say, we have to make a change and we have to improve worker safety now. The former director of IDOT, Kurt Steidel, put Malore and MDOT Chief Operations Officer and Chief Engineer Tony Kratifel together to co-chair what's known as the Michigan Work Zone Safety Task Force. Uh, that task force launched October 2018. It's made up of seven different teams that range in focus from law enforcement to education and technology. And Craddafield told me, you know, we intentionally tried to get people that maybe haven't always been at the table, but are kind of actively involved in operating or managing work zones so they could get fresh ideas and not necessarily revert to the same things. And I give some examples in the story. One is the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan. And the way it's explained to me is, uh, you know, police, police officers can give tickets, sure. but if there's no follow through from prosecutors, then the penalties don't stick. Another one uh, I thought was interesting is private driver's ed companies and young drivers. Both Malor and Kratifel noted that driver's ed schools in the state instruct their students to steer clear work zones. It's liability reasons. I can understand. At the same time, how are these drivers going to get experience driving through a work zone? In terms of technology or uh, new innovations, one source talked about different type of tape for the temporary lane markers that's easier to remove and therefore limit the time they're in harm's way. Credville said the goal of, of all this is to get people less desensitized to work zone deaths. He said, kind of get out of our numbness and pay more attention to it. And the parallel I wanted to make to the commercial airline industry, and this was something our former CEO, Deborah Herzman, brought up during uh, one of our all-staff meetings. All the stakeholders and even all the competing airlines got together to improve safety. There hasn't been a fatal crash involving U.S. commercial airlines since December 2009 because of those efforts. Again, I thought that was a fitting parallel and uh, maybe a path forward for this issue. And, you know, you need to kind of bring stakeholders from varying sides together to hopefully see some progress toward work zone deaths. Great. Well, thanks, Alan. We appreciate you sharing your insights on that topic and, and all the reporting you did on that story. For folks who want to learn more, go ahead and check out the April issue of Safety and Health magazine, and you can find Alan's story there.
If you're listening to this podcast, we're pretty sure that you like staying safe on the job and keeping others safe as well. We're also pretty sure that you want to stay safe and healthy when you're away from work, and we've got a great idea to help you out. It's Family Safety and Health Magazine from the makers of the award-winning Safety and Health Magazine. Family Safety and Health has tips and advice on topics from the home to the roadway and from your local parks and recreation areas to your medicine cabinet. Just go visit nsc.org wellness or call 800-621-7619 to learn how you can get a subscription for yourself, your coworkers, your friends, and your family. Remember, that's Family Safety and Health Magazine, brought to you by the same team that brings you the award-winning Safety and Health Magazine each and every month. One of the fun things about a podcast is listening to the speakers and topics and imagining things in your mind's eye. While I can't guarantee you our guest on this segment of five questions with dot, dot, dot is smiling at this very moment, I'd certainly be willing to venture as much. Those of you who know Tim Page Bodorf know eagerness and enthusiasm are part of his fabric. Tim's a senior safety consultant at Safe Start who also serves as a lecturer at Central Washington University and is vice president of the American Society of Safety Professionals Region 2. In addition, he's a 2018 recipient of the Distinguished Service to Safety Award, the highest honor of the National Safety Council. Tim is based in Arizona, but as you'll hear shortly, he's very much a traveling man. We're going to be asking him five questions related to safety and health or their jobs, and then conclude with a bonus question that sheds a little light on life away from occupational safety. So, Tim, welcome to the podcast. Uh, what's new and exciting? Thanks, Kevin and Alan and Barry. Appreciate it. New and exciting. I've been uh, trying to create a, not a blog, but sitting down and just kind of just gathering myself through this social distancing experiment with my own family. We've been uh, recording like a 18 minute segment video of things that we do throughout the day. And I caught myself in my Star Wars room, turning on lightsabers randomly and just checking, making sure the lights work and the kyber crystals are in place. So <laughs> I've been coming up with some creative ideas of what needs to be done. But I'm also, you know, working and got a lot of customers that are asking for my assistance and coming up with, a, you know, programs and procedures to help their, you know, employees face this uh, challenging and unprecedented time with COVID-19. Hi, Tim. This is Alan. You once wrote, I believe in our magazine, that life got in the way, quote unquote, of your aspirations to be a uh, professional baseball player or a high school band director after you graduate college. And you then went into the military and, and it was in the Marines that, where you essentially learned the safety profession with all the training that you received. For those that may not know you, can you walk us through your safety journey? Uh, thanks, Alan, for the question. That's a great question. I didn't, uh, at seven years old, it didn't say I'm going to be an occupational safety and health specialist or professional. As a matter of fact, that when I was seven, I really wanted to play baseball. Um, and some life things happened. And I'm grateful for the, the aspects of the military. It taught me a lot of things, mostly discipline. And I got, I got a job offer at a, at a Motorola facility here in Arizona as soon as I left the military. And the job offer was to work in the environmental health and safety department. And the only reason why they accepted me is because I had a certification for a train the trainer in Haswapper. Thinking about what I did in the military and how I got involved with occupational safety, I, I really didn't move into the safety department. I ended up doing inspections for hazardous waste containers and satellite accumulation areas. And then that kind of got me involved in um, working on the professional side. And I got a job offer and in, in the same department to work in a safety related field as a safety engineer. I took the position with the caveat that I had to go back and finish my undergraduate degree. And I just looking back at all the things that have occurred, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And I think since then, that was 1994, I've been involved with occupational safety since. And from 1998 on, I've been uh, working as a consultant. And I think uh, going backwards, looking at all of this, and I am, I'm grateful for all the things that have occurred. And I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody that there were certain people, mentors, people that overlooked what I was doing, that I was, I'm, I'm absolutely grateful for and now looking back. Because if those folks weren't there, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And a lot of those folks were in the Motorola days, 
but I have to certainly go back and thank them out loud. There's a few people, but quite frankly, I'd rather I'd rather reach out to them directly. But it's because of people and networking and looking back and you know just the journey itself has been quite amazing. But thanks for that question. That's that was a great one. And this is Barry, and I was curious that there are numerous areas for someone like you to consult. How do you narrow your expertise, or is it best to be a, a jack of all trades when it comes to safety consulting? That is a great question. If you're going to become a consultant, you're going to have to know a little bit uh, about everything or um, as much as you can. I will suggest, though, that when, it, like I said, I worked at Motorola starting out with chemistry safety. I ended up taking over programs for contractor safety management, and my focus changed. So as I progressed throughout my career, and this kind of taps into the first question as well, I ended up learning a little bit about what I was mostly running or working with as I progressed. After I left Motorola, I spent eight years focusing on utility safety for water and wastewater and some electrical utilities, but my focus stayed there. So I ended up getting really good at confined space entry, lockout, tagout, um, some machine guarding, and a lot of field safety for construction activities where there was a lot of temporary traffic control and trenching and excavation, and I became a specialist. And I actually got called by the California Water Environment Association as this confined space guru. So I, I ended up focusing in that regard, but ultimately um, consulting, I ended up getting questions like, can you come in and do a process safety management audit? Well, at the time I've maybe done one or two, but I didn't really specialize in it. So when people would ask, I would start to focus, start to study start to research, and then I would feel more confident with my yes answers to consult our customers as opposed to being warily saying no. So I, yes, I would say you'd have to be somewhat of a jack of all trades. And if you didn't know specifically the specialized answers in, in certain regards, in this networking of safety professionals, there are always people out there that are willing to help. Most I've found through memberships in NSC and the American Society of Safety Professionals. So if you're going to be a consultant, you're going to have to try to be a jack of all trades. But it's also good to focus on certain areas. And if you do the focusing of certain areas, like I did with utilities, I found that I was really engaged and had a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, people in that networking arena will actually reach out to you. Hey, I know that you've got a lot of experience with confined spaces. Can you help me out with this? And your networking consortium, so to speak, will help you become a better consultant. So yes, the answer is yes to both. Be a jack of all trades if you can and specialize in certain areas. And that way you can help out your network in regards to, well, what you could provide. And your consulting consortium, so to speak, becomes better for it. I know you travel about 60 times a year for work and you've referred to yourself in presentations as a traveling zombie, which is probably a description that many business travelers can relate to. Um, whether you're traveling for business or for pleasure, how can travelers avoid those safety pitfalls when you're in that zombie-like state? That is a fantastic question. Uh, Kevin, as you know, just before the uh, pandemic was declared, I ended up going to the Northeast Conference and Expo for the National Safety Council. My presentation there was life lessons from a traveling zombie. And what I didn't want to present was information about coronavirus, even though it came up as a topic quite a few times. I did spend a lot of time on the 60 plus trips that I traveled on. And I guess the best answer, not the long answer, but the best answer is, is don't travel. <laughs> but I, I wish it was that easy. Um, I get called all over the globe to go out and present. And what I find at the times where I'm most likely to be a zombie is at the airports, going to the hotels, getting a rental car and traveling from location A to location B, which is typically an airport to hotel or vice versa, hotel to customers to back to the airport. And my best recommendation for you is a lot of what I've learned with my time at Safe Start is to be able to technologically uh, use a technique that we call the critical error reduction te technique. So predict at the very beginning of your day when you're most likely to make a mistake. And those were actually moments for me when I was at the airport or transferring from an airport in a shuttle um, or from a shuttle to a hotel or even from a rental car to a hotel. And then at the night time when I was at the hotel, since I do a lot of work consulting and lecturing, 
I find that I'm actually working double duty in my hotel room. So therefore, it sometimes affects my work during the day. So one of the things that I recommend is that you can actually try to reduce the amount of critical errors that you make by using techniques. And the best way to start is to predict in the very beginning of the day is ask yourself, when am I most likely going to make a mistake? Where would it be and what time would it be? And the moments that you're predicting this throughout the day, I'll literally, if you just say, oh, here's that moment that I predicted very part of the day at the very beginning of the day. This is the moment that I raise my awareness. So it'll help you get out of those zombie-like moments. Um, I would suggest, though, that there are other views that are out there that I'm not going to argue with or, or support. I just know that whatever works for you, whatever works best for you, that's what you should continue on doing. So if there are things like new view safety or safety differently or even safety 2.0, any proponents for HOP. If you've got a safety system that will help you in regards to minimizing human error, by all means, that's what you should do. But a lot of it comes down to individual factors, individual components, internal factors that you might have that some folks can't take care of or create a system for you. One of the photos that I showed at that conference in Pittsburgh for the NSC was a photograph of folks that are in the United Kingdom. And this is true. They're, they're photos of foam pads that are around light poles when you're walking out on the street surfaces. So zombie moments that I, that I used in the presentation were people that are walking around, reading their phones and walking at the same time, which is akin to driving and texting, but with a little less hazardous energy. But what you'll find in the UK is that they're putting these foam paddings around centuries old light poles. And the light poles, obviously, since they're centuries old, are going to be around for quite some more time. But when people are walking and reading their texts or people are walking and not paying attention, regardless of what's on their mind, they put these pads up to help well, prevent injury. I would argue that the person can actually put the phone down and try to avoid the zombie-like moment first. And if they need to enter those moments, try to minimize those moments as much as possible. So to kind of summarize a zombie-like state, I, the best thing to do is don't put yourself in a state in the first place, but when you find yourself in a state, use the zombie-like state as a triggering moment, so to speak, to help you raise your awareness and be able to predict in the very first part of the day when and at what time and where will you most likely make a mistake or an error. And then when those times occur and when you're in those specific uh, positions, try to avoid them and raise your awareness. Great question. I appreciate it. We all know safety professionals pledge to do all they can for workplace safety. But in, in presentations, you contend that workers aren't always carrying that same mindset or ethos into their day or in, in into their home. In what ways can kind of safety pros carry that work into home and away from work? A beautiful question. I, I'm going to tell you, um, since we're in this unprecedented times with COVID-19, I see it now. Um, even though the government will have hand out guidelines and some states are actually for, uh, predicting or saying that you need to shut down and stay at home, not everybody heeds those words. As a matter of fact, if you look uh, two days ago, there were people that were spring breaking in Florida until they shut down the beaches. Even we tell them this is what you have to do. You'll still find people that will, I don't know, to take shortcuts, do whatever they got to do. But for safety professionals, if they want to spread the word, the wisdom, and they go home and they want to spread the word, the wisdom there, one of the best things that you can do is to be able to humble yourself and share stories of times where you know you've made mistakes. Now, I see it a lot right now in the press conferences with um, Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York. He's providing a lot of what he thinks needs to be done. But at the end of each presentation, he'll provide a little personal spin. And what he does is he goes through anecdotal storytelling and it gets people to understand. Um, it's remarkable, though, on social media, as you review his remarks, you'll see that people are responding more towards his leadership style. And the reason, I believe, is because of his anecdotal storytelling style. There are things that we do at the workplace that are working for us. And you would like to have kind of a 24-7 total worker health, whatever you're going to call it, around-the-clock safety for all of your employees. One of the best things you can do is to be humble and say, I have made mistakes in this regard. 
sort of like at home. If you stand on an office chair at home, but you don't do that at work, it's the same type of ethic. So the best thing to do is, well, if I'm going to do this at home, why is it okay for me to do this at home? Tell that story. Why you went through that decision-making process. Well, you know, there's no safety professionals at my house. Well, ironically, you, the safety professional standing on an office chair, you are a safety professional. And there is no safety switch that gets turned off at the end of the day at the workplace. Safety is a 24-7 element. And safety can be carried all the way around the clock. So a couple of things, storytelling, be able to be willing to share those stories, it doesn't matter where the incident, error, or mistake occurred. And then after you tell those stories, think about what you've done. And if there's a procedure at the workplace, wonder if that procedure at the workplace can be carried or maintained at home. You lift properly at work, then lift properly at home. If you know health and wellness is important at work to do the activities that are at work, then do the same at home. Maintain a safety lifestyle 24-7. That's important. With all the consulting work you do, I'm sure you're exposed to a number of different both common and, and emerging safety issues. And I was curious, what do you see as, as some of the biggest issues in safety today? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, there's three of them that I presented for my keynote for the NSC. It was in the Indianapolis, and I called it the future of safety. Um, and I'm usually typically talking about them as a positive aspect of what we can do to get better. But since the question was about what we see as the biggest issues, I'll reframe them. The first one that I thought was important, and we've already talked about it, was the lack of 24-7 focus. You'll notice that NIOSH is actually starting to extend research under total worker health. So 24-7 studies have been done now, and some of what we've already talked about is if we can get people to start practicing and sharing things that they're doing at home, then ultimately they'll bring it back to the workplace and vice versa. So that's important. So the, the first issue is, is the lack of 24-7 focus. The second for me is the lack of integration into like concepts. If you raise your awareness at the workplace, it's likely that your quality and productivity can be achieved better. So we can actually utter and mention safety, quality, and productivity in the same sentence. And those visions, those missions, those goals, usually strategies wrapped around values, can help an organization get better. But we've got to get the people better first. So if you want your organizational culture to change with both uh, all three, safety, call, uh, quality, and productivity, it's usually the one that can be done over the others, and the others will have collateral benefits. And I'm going to use the Paul O'Neill strategy. He said safety was what they needed to do at Alcoa quite a few years back. But since safety was the thing that they focused on, you notice the quality and productivity got better. And then, of course, so did their people. So that was one thing that was important. So integration of quality, safety, and productivity together. And then the last thing I think I think all of us can do better at is being more of safety friends than safety cops. Barry, can I ask you a question in return and just do sure. yes or no answer? Um, sure. Have you ever been pulled over by a cop? Yes. And did you say to yourself when you got pulled over, uh, this is an opportunity for a great learning opportunity? No. Did you say, did you say oh, this is a great, <laughs> a great learn? No, you didn't probably. But actually, what we no, found my reaction was, was, what in the world did I do wrong? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then, of course, the cop comes up to your window and you roll the window down. And this is probably a role playing conversation. But uh, I'll be the cop and you be the you be the driver. Uh, do you know okay. why I pulled you over? No, sir. And then typically what you would say afterwards is, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what we find in the safety business is that there's a lot of safety professionals out there who do a great job at enforcement and compliance is their biggest, biggest focus. But when they actually go out and have conversations with employees, you'll find that there's a negative tent tone with enforcement. Uh, you should be doing this. You shouldn't have been doing this. I, well, you know, I can write you up for this or I can terminate you for violating a safety infraction. Okay. And in my research, I found um, right now there are 13 cities that do it. But I'm going to play a different play with you. I pulled you over, Barry, because I clocked you going the speed limit, and I wanted to give you a gift card to Best Buy to say thank you. Wow. Has that, that changes has the, that ever... the conversation completely. Yeah. Has that ever happened? <laughs> no. 
Okay. No, 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 it hasn't all happened. Yeah, it hasn't happened to a lot of people either. But <laughs> in my hometown here in Mesa, Arizona, they did it over the holidays. And they actually found that accidents have gone down just simply by thanking people for going the speed limit. Wow. And the approach, the approach to driving was quite amazing. I, me, a lot of professionals arguably could probably do the same thing at the workplace. So from an emerging issue, I would say that we could probably be more safety friends than safety cops. So we can deliver a more positive safety message, specifically when it comes around or deals with employee behavior. And a lot of folks right. don't like talking about it, but that's what's important to me. So emerging issues for me is the, the elevation of 24-7 safety and, of course, the integration of quality, safety, and productivity in the same value stream, and then being more of a safety friend and not a safety cop. Tim, we, uh, we want to go back to your baseball and music aspirations and blend those two together for our final question, bonus question, which we call our pop quiz. And I know you mentioned Paul O'Neill in a different light, but it, it made me think of the, the Reds and Yankees slugger in your previous answer. So let's let's imagine that COVID-19 has passed and all is safe and right, and the baseball season's begun, and the Diamondbacks all of a sudden need a slugger, and they call up uh, Tim Page Bodorf. You're stepping out of the dugout, bat in hand, and walking to the batter's box, and what we want to know is what would your walk-up song be? <laughs> Um, that is a fantastic question. I, <laughs> I, I have to give that some thought. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, without giving any thought, if it was a different generation and I was in high school or college, I would say ACDC's Highway to Hell. <laughs> would, <laughs> that would be my first one. But see, now that I've grown and gotten more wisdom, I probably would narrow it down between two. One of them is uh, U2's Where the Streets Have No Name, just because of the simple guitar riff. That means a lot to me. It's an infinite guitar that uh, sounds off in the very beginning and, and the very first words is I want to know. I literally would say that uh, we all want to know. Um, and with this regard for COVID-19, a lot of a lot of uncertainties because of, well, the lack of knowledge or not knowing. And I think the other song I would pick, and it's ironic because I got a call from one of the conference organizers for the NSC when I did the a keynote in Indianapolis, they'd asked me for a walk-up song, and I had to give that some thought. And the walk-up song I picked, and it would probably be the same now, is Uptown Funk from Bruno Mars and the guitarist Mark Ronson. That would be my that would be my walk-up song because I'll tell you what, I walk up with that song being played, and I wanna I wanna wiggle, I wanna dance, and I literally, when Debbie Hirschman was there, she was on stage. I said, let's, let's dance. And she danced and we danced and we had a little, so after my introduction, um, it got us to move and it got us to smile. So I would argue that um, in this, specifically in this point of time, we could probably use some more smiles. So that would be my walk-up song. And that's an incredible pop quiz question. Thank you for that. Oh, no problem. Yeah, it's, that's our second one. So we'll, we'll look to build on it, but, but thanks for, Thanks for that answer. Thank you across the board for, for your time and for spending it with us and lending your stories and expertise to, to On the Safe Side. Uh, we do look forward to being in touch and hopefully seeing you at the, the 2020 NSC Congress and Expo in Indianapolis. So thanks again very much, Tim. Well, guys, this is episode two, so we know the drill. Uh, we've covered and attended our share of baseball games, and we've surely pondered the pop quiz question that we just posed to Tim. Uh, so then that would be, you know, what would your walk-up song be? don't usually have the speed for a leadoff hitter, but I suppose I'll go first. Um, as with Tim, I gave this some thought, and I've thought about it for a while, and I remember a few years ago learning something that I don't know if it's applicable to every park because I can think of some cases where there's words right away, but I was told by a minor league PR director that, at least on their level of pro ball, there could not be any spoken words in the first 15 seconds. So but like I said, I've thought of a lot through the years. I know Crazy Train, Chipper Jones, That's those are words right away. But I'm not going to pick any Ozzy Osbourne. I'm going to pick uh, Rocky Mountain Way by Joe Walsh. And Tim had mentioned a couple there, but one of them he just mentioned it really had a good riff. And that it came down to that for me. I just thought the way that song opens, um, I'm not necessarily a huge Joe Walsh solo or Eagles fan, but I just I feel like you're coming up to bat. You want to get yourself going. You want to get the crowd going. And that sort of does it with the riff, with the guitar, and there's a little piano in there. Incidentally, it came on the other day when I was driving around, and it, it mentions Casey at the bat, which I had kind of forgotten about. 
So hopefully I wouldn't do what Mighty Casey did and strike out with the, the bases loaded, but it would it'd be a good song, I think. Well, as a number two hitter, I would definitely be able to lay down a sacrifice bunt. I know that's not in vogue anymore necessarily. <laughs> but actually, somebody asked this question on Twitter a couple of years ago, and I actually just tried to think of what are the worst walk-up songs. And uh, first, which was the the mm, 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 song from Crash Test Dummies, and I also thought of <laughs> I'm Henry the I'm Henry the Eighth I Am by the Herman's Hermits. And then like fade into you by Mazzy Star. Those would be the worst, I, I feel like. But I, I'm I'm kind of along with Kevin here. I think you got to get the crowd kind of pumped up. And I was uh, thinking, yeah, by Usher, uh, Little John and Ludacris, and maybe even something cheesy like Cotton Eye Joe. Or if we're going hard rock, kind of along with Tim, uh, something by ACDC, TNT, or Animal by Pearl Jam. Okay, all good choices for sure. I I. When I think about this question, I think about the Florida Marlins who did kind of an anti walk up song day and and one player came up to Party in the USA by Miley Cyrus, which I thought was really comical. There's so many good choices though, but I think I've I've narrowed it down to one and that would be uh, I want something energetic. So I would go with Start Me Up by the Rolling Stones. That would be my choice. Good one. Good one. We want to say thank you to everyone out there for spending some time with us today and remember if you want to keep your family, your employees, and your colleagues safe, we have just the publication for you, Family, Safety, and Health. Each issue is packed with helpful tips that will keep families safe at home and in the community, along with informational articles about your health. To get a free copy or to learn more about it, visit nsc.org wellness, or you can subscribe today by calling 800-621-7619. We'll be back next month with a new episode of On the Safe Side, but in the meantime, feel free to tell a friend about our podcast. If you'd like to share some feedback with us, go ahead and uh, email us at safehealth at nsc.org. And to find stories like Alan's Work Zone Safety article and all the latest news about safety and health, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. And if you're on social media, make sure you follow us. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We'd like to thank our NSC colleagues and sound gurus, Rob Neustadt and Chelsea Yang, for working with us here in the studio today, and our special guest, Tim Page Bodorf. Original music for this podcast was provided by Steve Maslin. We'll be back next month to share more safety news, talk to trusted voices from around the profession, and have a laugh or two. Until then, please, everyone, stay on the safe side. Mm-hmm.